Hello, my name is Matthew Godfrey. I'm the Historic Churches Support Officer with the Diocese of Lincoln. What we're trying to demonstrate today with this video is some of the interesting facts and features about your local church and how this can be used to rewrite your church guidebook, attract visitors, or even have some special feature which may attract grant funding and help with the church building. We'll be looking at the church fabric from the inside and the outside to try and show you how the church has changed over the many centuries and how it's evolved or how it's shrunken. When you're doing the research on your church building, it's important to realise it's been here for over a thousand years. So it's experienced a great deal of changes over that time. It's gone from a Roman Catholic church to a Church of England church under the reign of Henry VIII in the 1540s. And since the 1540s, there's been a great deal of change, not only on the exterior, but also on the interior. Um, which has changed radically in the last 500 years. It's not until we get to the Victorian period that we get any sense of that former grandeur coming back into our church buildings. There are many features in our church buildings which may seem puzzling to us today, and these only give the merest hints to what the church would have looked like in the medieval period. The church we're looking at today is Carlton Scroop St Nicholas in Lincolnshire. There's been a church here since 1086 because it's been mentioned in the Doomsday Book. This church has many exterior and interior features which are of interest, which we will be showing you to help you piece together the history of your own church. St Nicholas Church, in common with many medieval churches, shows on the outside how it's developed. Now, when you're trying to work this out with your local church, a good place to start is looking for straight lines or straight joints within the church fabric. Here, we can see there's a straight joint here with the aisle here, which is 14th century, and the tower here, which is earlier. So clearly what we've got here is this aisle has been built against the tower. Another important area to look at is to look at the lower level of the wall where the plinth is. At the base here, plinths from different periods of building rarely get continued round. So we can see here on the earlier part of the building, there isn't the plinth at the base. And when we look at the later part of the building, we have this more decorative plinth there. So that clearly shows, as well as the straight joint, there's something going on with that bit of the building. There are many reasons why an aisle could be added onto a church. Firstly, it could be because of population increase, they need more seats. Secondly, it could be for, to show or demonstrate parochial ambition. It could also be because the church needs more processional space or an additional space for an altar. The alternative is if your church happens to have an arcade of blocked arches on the side of it. This can show the opposite. This can show where an aisle has been actually removed from the church building. Now this can be caused by a drop in population, a drop in churchgoers. And what happens in these instances is it's, it's more expensive for the parish to keep the aisle there. They can't afford to maintain it. So what they do is they take down the north aisle or the south aisle or both to save money and concentrate their resources on blocking the aisle arcades up and looking after the remaining part of the building. By looking at your church building in this way, it is possible to trace the relative prosperity or otherwise of your church building and the community in which it's in. In this respect, we can see that the, our church buildings are historical document in stone. Another thing to look at with your church building are changes in fabric, as they can be diagnostic as well. Take for example here again at St Nicholas, we can see on the lower section of the tower, we have relatively roughly coursed rubble blocks. If we look above this, we can see we have finely coursed ashlar work with very fine joints to it. Now, what seems to be the case here is the lower part of the tower is obviously the earlier part and the top part has been rebuilt. Now, we know when this top part of the church tower was rebuilt because if we look right at the top, there's a date plaque on it which says 1632. That date refers to the fact that the earlier tower and spire collapsed. So from above the rough rubble, that whole tower has been rebuilt. Seldom is the evidence on churches quite as clear as it is here at St Nicholas. But by looking at differences in the fabric and the way they've been built and how they match up or join to one another, that's a good way of working out the relative different phases of your church building and coming up with certain dating evidence for when bits were built on or when bits were taken away. On the porch, there's also a date stone which says 1616 on it. Now, if we look at the porch building itself, 
It's a very good 13th century example, which is relatively unaltered. So the date stone here may simply refer to a repair rather than a rebuild. This kind of demonstrates the kind of caution you need to have with date stones. Some may relate to perhaps rebuilding, as we've just seen with the tower. Others may just relate to a repair. Many churches have these weathered remains of mass dials or scratch dials, as they're sometimes called. These were used to tell service times when the church in the medieval period. Now, most would have had a gnomon or a piece of wooden dowel which came out of the middle, which cast the shadow on the time of the sundial. This particular example is a later medieval one, and this has dots all the way around rather than just at the bottom. Now, effectively, the top half of this dial doesn't work because it never gets a shadow on it. However, the reason we think that sundials were put like this on walls was because they were mimicking the first mechanical clocks which were first coming in in churches in about the 15th century. Before we enter the church, we normally go into the porch. Now, most churches have a south porch, some will also have a north porch. Now, the porch has a number of purposes. Primarily, it's here to give some protection against inclement weather, particularly in the UK. In the medieval period, it was also a liturgical antechamber where the first part of the wedding ceremony or the first part of the baptism ceremony started. Stepping inside St Nicholas Church, we can see it conforms to the plan we would expect of our church buildings. So we have a north aisle, we have a south aisle, we have a west tower, and we have the chancel at the east end, and the part I'm standing in now, which is the nave. In order to date the various parts of the church, um, we have produced a useful architectural guide and also a short PowerPoint presentation to help you date the different bits. Standing at the west end of the church now, we can see the wonderful 12th century semicircular Romanesque arch. This arch is contemporary with the tower fabric we have just seen out on the outside of the building, so it gives you a good date for the lower sections of the tower. At the west end of the south aisle is the font. Fonts are usually positioned near the main entrance of the church and are a welcoming symbol in almost every parish church in the country. Baptism was an essential rite of passage for every child to enter the Christian fellowship of the church. Lincolnshire has some really good examples of medieval church fonts. And these can vary in immensely in terms of their design and decoration. Some church fonts will show biblical scenes such as the life of Christ or the life of a particular saint. Others will have geometrical designs such as this one here at Carlton Scroop, and others still may have local folklore or legends on them. What sort of iconography is on the font at your local church? Medieval fonts, like this one at Carlton Scroop here, tend to be quite large. This was because in this period, total immersion would have been the way of baptism, although in practice, it seems this was really done. After the Reformation in the 1540s, church font sizes tend to get smaller. This is because there is a preference then for aspersion with holy water rather than submersion in holy water. As the holy water stayed in the font at all times, it was important to protect it from misuse. Sometimes this misuse would have been black magic or superstitious uses. So what the church authorities did from the 13th century was suggest that the water was secured in the font with a font cover. Now, medieval church fonts, you can often see the remains of these locking mechanisms which held the church font cover in place. Here at Carlton Scroop, we can see there are remains of metalwork, which would have been the hasp and staple, so to speak, which held the font cover in place. Now returning to look at the building fabric again, here above the west arch, tower arch, which we've looked at a few moments ago, we can see the faint remains of a former roof line, which is relatively flat compared to the 19th century roof above. This flatter roof line is perhaps an indication of a 15th or 16th century roof structure on this church building. Could this earlier flatter roof structure we can see here been destroyed by the collapse of the upper part of the tower and spire we've mentioned on the exterior? If you look at your church building, you may be able to see a sharper pitched roof line or evidence of a sharper pitched roof line above the tower arch or the chancel arch. If you trace that roof line down, it usually corresponds with the top 
of the aisle arcades or the nave arcades. Now, these roof lines sometimes change. And in some churches, this sharper roof line has been changed for a flatter roof line, like we see here, usually because a clerestory level has been added. Now, a clerestory level is a row of higher level lights or higher level windows within the church, which increase the lighting within the building and also show a parochial ambition for a, for a bigger church building. Now, as you are moving the wall level up with these additional windows to actually get the apex of the roof beneath the bell openings of the tower, you need to install a lower flat lead roof. Now here at Carlton Scroop, we don't have any evidence of a former clerestory level. All we have is this evidence of a lower flat lead roof, possibly from the 15th or 16th centuries. This could imply that the parish here were trying to kind of show a certain status with their church building, even without adding a clerestory level. Another interesting feature of our medieval church buildings can be found at the chancel arch in the church. Now the chancel arch divides the nave, the area I'm standing in now, from the chancel, which is the eastern end of the building where the altar is located. Often, you'll see in medieval churches, there's a high level door leading to nowhere, or there can be a corresponding door at low level. Now access to these doorways from a low level can be through via a small spiral staircase, which leads up to one high, higher up, or in the case here at Carlton Scroop, there is no low level door. So the only access to this doorway would have been via a timber ladder or timber staircase located in the North Isle. These doorways once would have served a rood screen and the rood loft above, which would have gone all the way across the chancel arch where I'm standing. Now in the medieval period, the chancel was the domain of the clergy. And the chancel rood loft and rood screen was here to effectively frame the Eucharist going on at the east end of the church and also provide additional areas which could be used within the Christian calendar. Now the rood loft would have been a wide platform or balcony which went across here and that would have been used in certain services for instance say the nativity or Easter or harvest and psalms would have been read from up there, songs would have been sung from up on the rood loft as well. We have evidence from the 1560s in Lincolnshire after the Reformation that many of these rood lofts were taken out, which is why we're left with only a few clues on what would have been here originally. As I just mentioned, a doorway is a very good clue, but sometimes these doorways can get blocked up and no longer visible. So other things you need to look for to see if you can work out where the rood screen was are for notches in nearby arches or on nearby walls, which could show where timbers were actually fixed in to the masonry. Rood screens are put in churches from about the 13th century into the 14th century, but by the 15th century, they're virtually in every parish church throughout the country. Now we're at the eastern end of the building, um, in the chancel where the altar is positioned. Now this altar here is in broadly the same position as the medieval one would have been, and is bathed by coloured light from the windows above. In most cases, in most parish churches, the stained glass will now be Victorian. However, here at Carlton Scroop, we have some very fine early medieval glass. The medieval glass here is a very rare survival and only survives in the top upper part of the window, as you can see. The date has been estimated to be around about the 13, early 1300s. What's not clear with this glass is we don't know if it's original to the church or has been brought in at a later date from elsewhere. Here on the south wall of the chancel, we have two features which would be common to most medieval churches. The first of these is called the piscina. In some churches, this may be a single sink. Here at Carlton Scroop, this is a double sink, roughly late 1300s. The function of a piscina is for the priest to actually wash his hands and wash the holy vessels before and after the service. The wine and the water will then flow into the consecrated ground of the churchyard. This particular style of piscina is a double bowl piscina from the late 13th century. The puzzling feature here is why this piscina is so far into the corner. It normally would be more level in line with the altar. What this perhaps tells us is that somewhere in its long history, 
Carlton Scroop Church, the east wall has somehow been shortened and this piece of the wall here has been opened out still to allow access to this piscina. Sometimes it is also possible to find a piscina elsewhere in the church. These are normally located at the east end of the aisles, normally on the south wall. Here at Carlton's group, we have a 14th century piscina in the south aisle and a 13th century piscina in the north aisle. The other feature is the sedilia, which is the feature here, and this is usually in the form of a seat. Sometimes it will be three seats with small arches above each one, divided by a shaft, but in this case, it's one big large seat. Now in the medieval period, this seat would have been for the priest, the deacon and the subdeacon. Quite often with the sedilia, it's difficult to imagine how people would have sat in them comfortably. The floor level has been raised in the 19th century, so this makes it look as though the people who have once sat in the sedilia had shorter legs than they actually had. Looking westwards, back down the nave towards the tower arch, we can see now that the walls are rather bare stonework. This is a thing that Victorian restorers tended to do. The medieval church would have had plastered walls, would have had wall paintings, and been a riot of colour with the wall paintings and also the reflection from the stained glass windows. Examples of wall painting schemes in Lincolnshire include Corby Glen, St John, and Pickworth St Andrew. If your church has beer stone walls like this, try to imagine what it would have looked like in the medieval period with wall paintings and plastered walls. Another thing that has drastically changed the interior appearance of our church buildings are pews. Not many people realise that it's not until the Georgian and the Victorian period we get fully pewed churches like we're familiar with today. In the medieval period, there were hardly any pews at all. It's generally thought that most people who would have come to church would have brought small wooden stalls or similar with them to sit on. In some churches, there are sometimes remains of earlier stone benches, sometimes along the edge of the aisles, or more commonly, along the bases of columns, which were probably provided for the infirm or the elderly to sit on during the church service. And we have a good example here at Carlton's Group. With stone benches on column bases, it sometimes pays to be cautious in terms of their interpretation, as sometimes that may just be an indication of changes in floor level and they may not have originally been intended to be in bases. Pews start to become more common in the later medieval period. And even then, we wouldn't expect to see a fully pewed church. They would have been paid for by wealthy patrons or the higher status members of the congregation in small batches or in small blocks of pews. Here at Carlton Scroop, we have probably the remains of one of these small blocks of pews with these 15th century pew ends. Now, these are cut very crudely. They're probably local and they are the remains of some of the very earliest pews in the church here. And in the Victorian period, church pews varied immensely in quality and design. Some pews would have been off the peg, so to speak, in the Victorian period, and others would have been more carefully designed and part of a, a bigger, grander scheme from a prominent Victorian architect, for example. Here in St Nicholas, there are some very good 18th century memorials. Monuments, memorial brasses and ledger stones can be found in almost all of our parish churches. These can be dedicated to a local historical figure, a national figure, a wealthy local family, or the local lord. All of these monuments are important in telling the history of your church building, and they date from many different periods. Monuments, brasses, and ledger stones can all date from very early periods on, from the Norman Conquest in the 11th century, right through to the 20th century in the form of a war memorial. Understanding who is on these monuments can help tell us the story of the church building, how these people may have had an input in how the building developed, what furnishings and fittings the building has. All of those pieces of information are useful in telling the story and getting across the details of your church building. On leaving the church, don't forget to have a good look around the churchyard too when you're trying to work out the history and development of your church building. It's unlikely you will find any monuments earlier than the 17th century but there'll be plenty of monuments from the 18th and 19th centuries. These monuments can have important local figures, important national figures on them, and may help tell the story of the building. Also, there may be different types of monuments, for example. Here at Carlton Scroop, there are a group of slate monuments from the late 19th century, 
which indicate when this material was starting to come into this part of Lincolnshire and was not only popular on church roofs, but also for church memorials. In your church, are there any other types of memorials? Are there war graves, perhaps? These are all important things to consider when working out the history of the building. Here at Carlton's Group, the churchyard is a very good example of a God's Acre project. This one has been established for over 25 years, and like many others which have now become established in the county, is a green oasis for wildlife and wild plants. Hopefully, this short video presentation has given you a few things to think about when you're trying to unpick the history of your church building. Whether you're going to use that information to update your guidebook, as I've mentioned, or attract visitors to come and look around your church at some interesting features, or in fact, use all these different bits and pieces you find out about your church building to try and get some grant money together to maintain it for future generations to enjoy.